Before reciting the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the very means of conquest, one should first offer respectful obeisances unto the personality of Godhead Narayana, to Narayan Rishi, the supermost human being, and to Mother Sarasvati, the goddess of learning, and unto Srila Vyasadeva, the author, Nasta Prayeshu Bhadreshu. Nicham Bhagavata Seva, Bhagavad Yu Tamashla Ke Bhaktir Bhavati Naistiki. So today, as Melanie mentioned, today is the anniversary of the appearance day of Lord Balaram. And um, so uh, we'll read some uh, pastimes of Lord Balaram. And it's described in Bhagavad Gita, Janma Karma Chame Divyam Evam Yoveti Tattvata Tattva Deham Punar Janma Neti Mameti Sojuna. Krishna describes to Arjuna, yeah, one who understands the transcendental nature of my uh, uh, appearance, activities, pastimes, disappearance. Uh, but for such a person, then, then we come to Krishna. Mm. So, <clears throat> All right, so this Vaishnavism, Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, this is uh, a monotheistic uh, theology. And we said, because sometimes we hear like, okay, so there's Balaram, there's Krishna, there's Brahma, there's Shiva, there's Indra, there's so many, so many gods, this and that. No, it's monotheistic. Right? So one, one supreme source, one origin, one God. And this uh, one supreme personality of Godhead manifests in so many forms with so many pastimes. <clears throat> and so, so we can think about it because like I, I have my activities, I have my pastimes and you have your pastimes and activities and so we can see if we look at our nature, our propensity, where we want to hear about activities and pastimes. Mm. So that's very natural. That's very natural. And so if we have our activities, how can we deny to the Supreme, our source, activities? Right? How can there be something in the effect us that does not exist in the source, right? Like we have so many varieties of activities and relationships and adventure and romance and so many types. And we like to walk in nature and we like to dance and sing and we, and we, like, we go to work and we have so many varieties of activities. So how is it that in the source it's, it's just this monotonous white light, no activities. How does that make sense? What's the logic? There is none. No. So, so activity, pastime, everything that we do and it, I like to do here, this is actually a shadow reflection of what exists in the pure form in source, in source, as rich and variegated and apparently alive as the pastimes are in the material realm, this is just a shadow reflection of the original vibrancy of transcendental variegatedness, trans phenomenal activities that's there in the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So activities and song and vibration and words, they start in transcendence, not that they don't exist in transcendence, they exist in transcendence in their original pure form. So these uh, pastimes in Srimad Bhagavatam, which you might say is the follow-up literature to Bhagavad Gita, 
these pastimes in Srimad Bhagavatam, these are transcendental, meaning we transform, we transition our propensity to hear about activities and pastimes to the pastimes of Srimad Bhagavatam or any genuinely transcendental literature, and then we get purified. Then we're not, because like the more we hear about the material pastimes of ourselves or a, a, a movie actor or a sports or political personality or an intellectual, we become more and more agitated because the self's becoming more and more alienated from itself. And so, okay, yeah, so let's, let's just stop hearing anything. That's not possible. It's our nature to want to hear. So we transfer that nature to hear. This is, this is the original propensity of the soul to hear about the activities, pastimes of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and, and his expansions and his pure devotees. Ah, then we're completely satisfied. Then, then we're eager for more and more on a platform of full fulfillment. Not, I need something different. I need to change the channel. I need to click on something different because I'm still agitated. I'm not satisfied. Mm. So as Mother Malini was saying, so Sri Balaram is the first expansion of Sri Krishna, the personality of Godhead. And <clears throat> particularly in the, the tenth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, these are directly the, I'll say story, but story can mean like some sort of myth mythology. So this is not mythology, this is history. So these are uh, 89, 90 chapters of Sri Krishna, the personality of Godhead. And, and, uh, and uh, there's maybe about seven, eight chapters that particularly focus on the pastimes of Sri Balaram in, in this 10th canto. And so again, these are actual real history, real pastimes. And it's a qualitatively different experience to give our hearing propensity to these pastimes compared to any material pastimes. It's purifying for the heart, cleansing of the diamond of the soul. It's described early in the Bhagavatam. Shushu shoshadhanasya vasudeva katavunchi shamhat seveya vibra punya tirta nishevanat. That, well, by associating with, by serving, those devotees like Srila Prabhupada and his sincere followers, those devotees who are completely free from vice, great service is done and one develops an attraction to hear the pastimes of Vasudev, Sri Krishna, to hear the pastimes of Balaram. So just like if we associate with people who, oh, did you see that movie? Did you see that? Oh, did you, uh, did you, uh, watch this game, watch this game, and did, did, you, did you watch this, uh, did you read that article about the news and politics? Okay, then we become attracted. Oh, no, no. So we associate with those who are like interested to hear about Krishna and his expansions and pure devotees, then we develop that attraction. And then more and more, we connect with our original bliss. So of course, Srila Prabhupada, as our current Acharya, current link to Sri Krishna's Prabhupada, Lord Balaram's Prabhupada, Malini mentioned Balaram is the Adi Guru, the original spiritual master. So Srila Prabhupada represents Lord Balaram. So um, of course, Prabhupada gave us a process. I, I mentioned that because there are some groups where the idea is like they'll, they'll focus practically exclusively on the pastimes of Krishna and the gopis. Um, and um, of course, these are fully transcendental pastimes described in chapters 29 to 32 and other places in the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. But uh, oftentimes, such groups, it's kind of, it's motivated to agitate the sex impulse and not to purify one's existence. So it's kind of like a charade of spiritual life. Of course, the pastimes are always completely transcendental. Same time, we want to look at what's my consciousness in approaching these, these pastimes. So Srila Prabhupada gave us a process of rigorously chanting Hare Krishna Japa, fulfilling a, a daily vow, to, to whatever extent we're serious, to actually progress in this process. 
to extent, to what extent we're serious to give our life to this process. And <clears throat> hardly at all serious, but just casually. Ah, I like to, I like the kirtan once in a while. That's wonderful. At the same time, we're encouraged, encouraged, like come to realization like this, make this truly your goal of life, make this the reason, make this the purpose and be willing to do austerity to purify our existence so that we're not forced to take birth again in a material body. And that's, that's what the sages are encouraging. If we're ready to give 0.01%, wonderful. And they were encouraged to move, move towards 100%. So a process where we read Bhagavad Gita, we read first canto of Bhagavatam, and naturally we come to these pastimes in the 10th canto of Bhagavatam. And at the same time, wherever we're at in our personal reading, on special appearance days, like the appearance day of Lord Balaram, um, that wherever we're at, it's a special day to, okay, let's, let's focus in on these pastimes. And again, I'll emphasize for our purification, these are actual historical descriptions. There may also be, there may also be metaphorical meaning, like this morning before Japa period, we read the pastime of Sri Balaram and the Pralamba Sura. Okay, so that's an actual pastime. We can also get symbolic meaning. Okay, that's different than oh, it's all symbolism. And then ultimately the Supreme is a puff of white light or something like that. Like with the Pralambasura pastime, <clears throat> like with the Pralambasura pastime. So we have <clears throat> this, this very non-devotional uh, character, <clears throat> very non-devotional personality, Pralamba. And he's coming, he's kind of, He's a shapeshifter and he appears in the form of a cowherd boy playing with Krishna and Balaram and the cowherd boys. And then he arranges that his team loses. So he's carrying Balaram because the losing team needs to carry the winning team on their shoulders. And he's carrying Balaram away. So we can take that symbolically like, okay, where might there be something or someone or some group it's looking like devotional service. It's looking like devotee. It's looking like Hari Bol, Hari Bol. But actually, if I use careful discretion, actually, this is taking me further and further away from actual enthusiasm for the process of Krishna consciousness Prabhupada gave us. So Balaram was realizing, hey, hey, this so-called coward boy is taking me away from the association of devotees. Oh, okay, all right. So Balaram took care of things in his inimitable way. All right, so, okay. So again, there's about eight or nine pastimes in Krishna book, the Supreme Personality of Godhead that particularly focus on Balaram. And here's one, I'm gonna start in the middle of a chapter. And this chapter is entitled, The Killing of Dantavakra, Vidarata, and Roma Harshan. It's towards the, it's in the second half of the 10th Canto. I'm hesitating to say the number of the chapter because there's different versions that you might have wherever you are. And the numbering is different in some editions. So it's, the title is The Killing of Dantavakra, Vidarata, and Roma Harsha, okay? And I'm going to start with a paragraph that starts with the words, once upon a time, Lord Balaram heard that there was an arrangement. So this is, in my version, it's the beginning of the sixth paragraph. It's the beginning of the sixth paragraph. It starts, once upon a time. Okay, nice, okay. All right, okay, so I'll read and maybe at some point we can, we can uh, take turns and about, about reading. 
All right, so let's focus in again, just like we chant Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Every line of these pastimes, it's a transcendentally purifying mantra. Once upon a time, Lord Balaram heard that there was an arrangement being made for a fight between the two rival parties in the Kuru dynasty, one headed by Duryodhan and the other by the Pandavas. He did not like the idea that he was to be only a mediator to stop the fighting, finding it unbearable not to take an active part on behalf of either of the parties. He left Dvarka on the plea of visiting various holy places of pilgrimage. He first of all visited the place of pilgrimage known as Prabhasa Kshetra. He took his bath there and he pacified the local Brahmins and offered oblations to the demigods, pitas, great sages, and people in general in accordance with Vedic ritualistic ceremonies. That is the Vedic method of visiting holy places. After this, accompanied by some respectable Brahmins, he decided to visit different places on the bank of the river Sarasvati. He gradually visited such places as Pratudak, Bindusar, Tritakupa, <coughs> Sudarshana Tirtha, Vishala Tirtha, Brahma Tirtha, and Chakra Tirtha. Besides these, he also visited all the holy places on the bank of Sarasvati River, running toward the east. After this, he visited all the principal holy places on the bank of the Yamuna and on the bank of the Ganges. <coughs> Thus, he gradually came to the holy place known as Nami Sharanya. This holy place, Nami Sharanya, is still existing in India. And in ancient times, it was especially used for the meetings of great sages and saintly persons with the aim of understanding spiritual life and self-realization. When Lord Balaram visited that place, there was a great sacrifice being performed by a great assembly of transcendentalists. Such meetings were planned to last thousands of years. When Lord Balaram arrived, all the participants of the meeting, great sages, ascetics, Brahmins, and learned scholars immediately arose from their seats and welcomed him with great honor and respect. Some offered him respectful obeisances and those who were elderly great sages and Brahmins offered him blessings by standing up. After this formality, Lord Balaram was offered a suitable seat and everyone present worshiped him. Everyone in, the, everyone in the assembly stood up in the presence of Balaram because they knew him to be the supreme personality of Godhead. <clears throat> Education or learning means to understand the supreme personality of Godhead. Therefore, although Lord Balaram appeared on the earth as a kshatriya, all the Brahmins and sages stood up because they knew who Lord Balaram was. Mother Malini, would you like to read? Yeah. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Unfortunately, after being worshipped and seated in his place, Lord Balaram saw Humaharshana, the disciple of Yasadev, the literary incarnation of Godhead, still sitting on the Vyasa side. He had neither gotten up from his seat nor offered him respect. Because he was seated on the Vyasa Sam, he foolishly thought himself greater than the Lord. Therefore, he did not get down from his seat or bow down before the Lord. Lord Balaram then considered the history of Roma Arshana. He was born in a Sutta family or a mixed family born of a Brahman woman and a Kshatriya man. Therefore, also Roma Harshan considered Balaram a Kshatriya. He should not have remained seated on a higher seat. Lord Balaram considered that Roma Harshan, according to his position by birth, should not have accepted the higher seating position because there were many learned Brahman and sages present. 
He also observed that Roma Harshan not only did not come down from his exalted seat, but he did not even stand up and offer his respect when Lord Balaram enters the assembly. Lord Balaram did not like the audacity of Roma Harshan, and he became very angry with him. When a person is seated on the Vyasasan, he does not generally have to stand up to receive a particular person entering the assembly. But in this case, the situation was different because Lord Balaram is not an ordinary human being. Therefore, also Omarshan Sutta was voted to be via, to, to, to the Vyasa sign by all the Brahman. He should have followed the behavior of other learned sages and Brahman who were present and should have known that Lord Balaram is the supreme personality of Godhead. Respect are always due to him, even though such a respect can be avoided in the case of an ordinary man. The appearance of Krishna and Balaram are especially meant for a re-establishment of the religious principles. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, the highest religious principle is to surrender unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It is also confirmed in the Srimad Bhagavatam that the topmost perfection of religiousness is to be engaged in the devotional service of the Lord. Thank you, Ram Prabhu, would you like to read? When Lord Balaram saw that Ramaharshan Sutta did not understand the highest principle of religiousness in spite of having studied all the Vedas, he certainly could not support his position. <clears throat> Ramaharshana Sutta had been given a chance to become a perfect Brahmana, but because of his ill behavior and his relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, his low birth was immediately remembered. Roma Harshan Sutta had been given the position of a Brahmana, but he had not been born in the family of a Brahmana. He had been born in a Pratiloma, Pratiloma family. According to the Vedic concept, there are two kinds of mixed family heritage. They are called Anuloma and Pratiloma. When a male is united with a female of a lower caste, the offspring is called Anuloma. But when a male unites with a woman of a higher caste, the offspring is called Pratiloma. Roma Harshan Sutta belonged to the Pratiloma <coughs> family because his father was a Kshatriya and his mother was a Brahmin. Because Roma Harshan's Transcendental realization was not perfect. Lord Balaram remembered his Pratiloma heritage. The idea is that any man can be given the chance to become a Brahmana, but if he improperly uses the position of a Brahmana without actual realization, then his elevation to the Brahminical position is not valid. After seeing the deficiency of realization in Roma Harsha and Sutta, Lord Balaram decided to chastise him for being puffed up. Lord Balaram therefore said, this man is liable to be awarded the death punishment because although he has the good qualification of being a disciple of Lord Vyasadeva, and although he has studied all the Vedic literature from this exalted personality, he was not submissive in the presence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, a person who is actually a Brahmana and is very learned must automatically become very gentle also. In the case of Ramaharshan Sutta, although he was very learned and had been given the chance to become a Brahmana, he had not become gentle. From this, we can understand that when one is puffed up by material acquisition, he cannot acquire the gentle behavior befitting a Brahmana. The learning of such a person is as good as a valuable jewel decorating the hood of a serpent. Despite the valuable jewel on the hood, a serpent is still a serpent and, and is as fearful as an ordinary serpent. 
If a person does not become meek and humble, all his studies of the Vedas and Puranas and his vast knowledge in the Shastras simply become outward dress, like the costume of a theatrical artist dancing on the stage. Lord Balaram began to consider thus, I have appeared in order to chastise false persons who are internally impure, but externally pose themselves to be very learned and religious. My killing of such persons is proper to check them from further sinful activity. Hare Krishna. So one thing that Prabhupada's emphasizing, that Bhagavatam's emphasizing, is that when one is on the transcendental pastime, then we don't bring up in the past this and that, like that. That that you that's whole thing. What's that? You mean position? The position. Yeah. yeah. One's in transcendental position. <clears throat> so then it's not about looking at someone's past. Uh, so that's the thing, this transcendental process of Krishna conscious bhakti yoga, it's not dependent on born in this type of family, born in that family. It's just not dependent on anything. It's a completely transcendental process to anything material. <clears throat> so the point's being emphasized here that, okay, Balaram started looking at Ramaharshan's past when Ramaharshan was clearly off the transcendental pastime. So yeah, we, like, we're, we follow the process that Prabhupada gave us. And then we experience, we're, we experience transcendence. And we talk about states and stages of consciousness. At the same time, it doesn't mean we're steadily on that stage of transcendence. And then perhaps the next moment or an hour later, we, we, be, we become attached to the same modes and same activities as when we were a teenager or something from childhood or, or like that. So. Um, uh, so when someone's on transcendence, then, then that's transcendental to, to nature and nurture considerations about the past. And once someone like Roma Harshan, uh, okay, now the way he's acting, I now bother him, let's look at the past to, to understand this. Um, Mother Lakshmi Priya, would you like to read? Thank you, sir. Lord Balaram had avoided taking part in the Battle of Kurukshetra, and yet, because of his position, the reestablishment of religious principles was his prime duty. Considering these points, he killed Romaharshana Sutta simply by striking him with a kusha straw, which was nothing but a blade of grass. If someone questions how Lord Balaram could kill Romaharshana Sutta simply by striking him with a blade of kusha grass, the answer is given in the Srimad Bhagavatam by the use of the word Prabhu, Master. The Lord's position is always transcendental, and because he is omnipotent, he can act as he likes without being obliged to the material laws and principles. This, thus, it was possible for him to kill Ramaharshana Sutta simply by striking him with a blade of kusha grass. Should I pass it to Rachel? Sure. At the death of Ramaharsha, mm -hmm. Sutta, everyone present, present became much aggrieved and there was warring and crying. Although all the Brahmanas and sages present, present their, their new Lord Balarama to be the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They did not hesitate to protect the Lord's action and they humbly submitted, oh dear Lord, we think your action is not in line with the religious principles. Dear Lord, Yadunam Dana, we may inform you that we Brahmanas posted Rama, Ramaharshana Sutta on that exalted position for the duration of this great sacrifice. He was seated on the Vaya by asana, by our election. And when one is seated on the Vyasana, Vyasasana, it is Im improper for him to stand up to receive a person. Moreover, we awarded Ramaharsana Sutta and 
undistributed, undisturbed duration of life. Under the circumstances, since your Lordship has killed him without knowing all these facts, we think that your action has been equal to that of killing a Brahmana. Dear Lord, deliverer of all fallen souls, we know certainly that you are the knower of all the Vedic principles. You are the master of all mystic powers. Therefore, ordinarily, the Vedic injunctions cannot be applied to your to your personality, but we request that you show your causeless mercy upon others by kindly atoning for this killing of Ramaharsana Sutta. We do not, however, suggest what kind of act you should perform to atone for killing him. We simply suggest that some method of atonement be adopted by you so that others may follow your action. What is done by a great personality is followed by the ordinary man. The, the Lord replied, yes, I must atone for this action, which may have been proper for me, but is improper for others. Therefore, I think it is my duty to execute a suitable act of atonement enjoyed in the authorized scriptures. Simultaneously, I can also give the Ramahar. Is this is Ramaharshana Sutta mm -hmm. life again with a span of long duration, sufficient strength, and full power of the senses. Not only this, if you desire, I shall be glad to award him anything else which you may ask. I shall be very glad to grant all these boons in order to fulfill your desires. This statement of Lord. Balarama definitely confirms that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is free to act in, in any way. Although it may be considered that his killing of Ramasana Sutta was improper, he could immediately counteract the action with greater profit to all. Therefore, one should not imitate the actions of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One should simply follow the instructions of the Lord. All the great learned sages present realized that present realized that although they considered the action of the Lord Balarama to be improper, the Lord was able to immediately compensate the greater prophets. Not wanting to detract from the mission of the Lord, sorry, detract from the mission of the Lord. In killing Ramaharsana Sutta, all of them prayed, O oh dear Lord, the uncommon use of your Kusha weapon to kill the Ramaharsana Sutta may remain as it is. Because of your desire to kill him, he should not be brought to life again. At the same time, your Lordship may remember that we sages and Brahmanas voluntarily gave him long life. Therefore, such a benediction should not be nullified, nullified. Thus the request of the learned Brahmanas in their assembly was ambiguous because they wanted to keep intact the benediction given by them that Ramaharsana Sutta would continue to live until the end of the great sacrifice. But at the same time, they did not want to nullify Balarama's killing him. Thank you. Thank you. Would someone else online like to continue reading? If not, okay, then. The Supreme Personality of Godhead therefore solved the problem in a manner befitting his exalted position and said, because the son is produced from the body of the father, it is the injunction of the Vedas that the son is the father's representative. Therefore, I say that Ugrashrava Sutta, the son of Ramaharshan Sutta, should henceforth take his father's position and continue the discourses on the Puranas. And because you wanted Ramaharshan to have a long duration of life, this benediction will be transferred to his son. 
the sun, Ugrashrava, will therefore have all the facilities you offered long duration of life in a good and healthy body without any disturbances and full strength of all the senses. So, of course, this is Sutta Goswami, the speaker of the Bhagavatam. And so, uh, uh, yeah, right there in the first chapter of the Bhagavatam, Srila Vyasadeva describes the gathering at Nami Sharanya, the thousand year sacrifice. And then the sages asked questions to Sutta Goswami, who had taken the seat, the Vyasa son, uh, installed by Lord Balaram. Mm -hmm. okay. Ugrashrava is, is a name for Sutta Goswami. Yes. Lord Balaram then implored all the sages and Brahmins that aside from the benediction offered to the son of Ramaharsha, they should ask from him any other benediction and he would be prepared to fulfill it immediately. The Lord thus placed himself in the position of an ordinary kshatriya and informed the sages that he did not know in what way he could atone for his killing of Ramaharshan, but whatever they would suggest he would be glad to accept. <clears throat> the Brahmins could understand the purpose of the Lord and thus they suggested that he atone for his action in a manner which would be beneficial for them. They said, our dear Lord, there is a demon of the name Baobala. He is the son of Iovala, but he is a very powerful demon. And he, he visits the sacred place of sacrifice every fortnight on the full moon and moonless days and creates a great disturbance to the discharge of our duties in the sacrifice. O oh, descendant of the Dasharha family, we all request you to kill this demon. We think that if you kindly kill him, that will be your atonement on our behalf. <clears throat> the demon occasionally comes here and profusely throws upon us contaminated impure things like pus, blood, stool, urine, and wine. And he pollutes the sacred place by showering such filth upon us. After killing Balvala, you may continue touring all these sacred places of pilgrimage <coughs> for 12 months. And in that way, you will be completely freed from all contamination. That is our prescription. <laughs> Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purport of the second volume, 23rd chapter of Krishna, the killing of Dantavakra, Vidurata, and Ramaharsha. The... Um... Lord Vyasadeva is yes. coming on. Sutta. Sutta Goswami. Yeah. Is that? Mm -hmm. So he's the son of Ramaharshan. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes. I thought he was, was the son of Vyasadeva or is he just. Sukadeva Goswami is the son of Vyasadeva. Sukadeva. Okay. Sutta Goswami. Okay. We got it. Right. Right. Yes, Sutta Goswami is the son of Ramaharsha. And Shukadeva Goswami, who's really the most famous speaker of Bhagavatam, is the son of Vyasadeva. Ramaharsha was a disciple of, of Vyasadeva. Yeah. yeah, we can certainly imagine that Sutta Goswami was similarly greatly learned. Uh, so not just because he was the biological son of Ramaharsha, did he? Take the seat of the Vyasa son, who is also fully realized in Bhagavatam. We can understand he was there when Shukadeva Goswami spoke Bhagavatam on the banks of the Ganges to Maharaj Pariksha. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, my memory is that Sutta Goswami is called Omaharsha Sutta. Yeah. Because he's the son of Omaharsha. Yeah. So Sutta means son. So, but here, Ramaharsha is called Ramaharsha and Sutta. So it's mm. some confusion for me that. Ramaharsha is referred to as Ramaharsha and Sutta. Yeah. Yes. Without right. what we read. So it seems like. And in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Ramaharsha and Sutta, as I'm remembering, yes. is the son of Ramaharsha. We, you know. Who is Sutta Goswami yeah. addressed like that in that last time, like, yeah, back when, yeah. So it seems, yeah, I, 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 I don't have insight in this, but it seems both 
Om Harshan, who was killed by Balaram with a piece of kusha grass, and Sutta Goswami, the speaker of Bhagavatam, mm -hmm. are both sometimes referred to as Om Harshan Sutta. Yeah. And then also Ugash Bhava and Sutta Goswami is referred here as Ugash Bhava Sutta. Yes. So that's something I noticed and I'm not sure how to compute. Yeah, I'm not sure. You know, may, maybe Roma Harshan's father is also called Roma Harshan. I, you know, we can only mm -hmm. speculate. I, 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 it might be there in the Mahabharata or something. And then Roma Harshan is also called Uvarshvaha. Perhaps. Yeah. I mean, we could, we could research that on Prabhupada's database. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I was interested because he says Rama Harshan was born in a Sutta family or a mixed family. Yeah. So Sutta has that meaning. Oh yeah, yeah. A mixed family. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking maybe it's like a Sutta with the long U versus the Sutta without the long U, which is short U. Maybe okay. that's what, what it is. Right, right, yes. Yeah, thank you for noticing that. Right, yeah. So that's the name of the type of mixed family, sutta. So sutta means that type of family, sutta means son. So that's why they call him Ramaharshana Sutta because it was yeah. mixed family. Right, it seems that way, yeah. So maybe son is without a long you? Uh, perhaps, yeah. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah, it could be a distinction there. If there is no other question, I have no other question. I have a comment. Uh -huh. comment a question. Okay, good. Is there any question? So uh, at the very beginning, before we started reading, you, you spoke about symbolism. Yeah. How um, those pastimes are real. They yeah. happen. All those places exist. All yeah. those personalities are real person. Yeah. Like in the Bhagavad Gita, you know, there is a part of your Kurukshetra. Yeah. There is a five Pandavas, there is the Tastra, the blind. And at the same time, they, they have symbolism attached to them. And you, you made that point. And I was thinking like, what is it the same for our lives too? Because those who are self-realized, they see symbolism in their life, mm. in what's happening, in the people that come to their yeah. life, in the event of their life. They see symbolism, yeah. but it doesn't mean that yeah. their life doesn't exist or mm. is not happening. All those people are, are, are not real people. Yeah. Yeah. So and I, I, I was just thinking of that, like yeah. to, to only think that it's either symbolism or reality. Right. It means it seems that what's in the source, like, you know, what's in the effect for us, it's, it's like that too. Mm. Like we have an event in our lives that we, yeah. we that symbolize different um, advancement or um, give us an indication about ourselves. Different layers of meaning. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. just was Thank thinking of that. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. I think I, I, uh, related to that, I, I, I've had an experience or had a wondering about people, maybe I have a judgment, that maybe they take a lot of symbolism in their lives. Oh, this person came into my life for this reason, and this, or this event happened for this reason, and it's kind of, and there can be an overemphasis of that to where it depersonalizes mm. the person to where it's like, everybody. oh, I know you're not, it's not really about you and me. This is like some larger meaning, or you're giving me yeah. a message, you're mm. teaching me a lesson. Right. And it takes away like the personality, the personal relationship, maybe some responsibility, you know, also practical yeah. responsibility just to, to relate to a person. Like, oh, it's not really about you and me. It's like some greater meaning. So I think that's. Yeah, that's you know, the same thing. Mayavadi, Mayavad philosophy is in, says the five Pandava didn't exist. Krishna didn't exist. Kokshatra is mm -hmm. not a real place. So in our life, we can do the same, like, like avoiding the reality of life in the name of symbolism. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
becomes a, a bypass. I appreciate the discussion. Yes, that, uh, right, because, okay, because like, like from a realized vision, a, a true sage is seeing like, yes, it's not about life or death, it's all about the time factor, and, and that's all true. And the time factor and karma and the gunas and like that. And at the same time, we can artificially go to like a level of realization that we're not really living in at the expense of seeing like practically, oh, okay, well, how, how was I ignorant in such a way that that led to this is a very, very practical, very practical lessons. And um, yeah, okay, like how come I'm holding on to guilt and shame? How come I'm holding on to this hostility? What's the shadow payoff I'm getting? And say, oh, this is all symbolic, uh, this and that. So you know, we can get into a philosophical spiritual bypass at the expense of very practical lessons that we're meant to learn from this human experience. <clears throat> Hare Krishna. Any other, any other uh, uh, comments, questions, sharing at this time? <clears throat> if not, then let's go on for another few minutes. We can go to the next chapter. The next chapter is entitled The Liberation of Balvala and Lord Balaram's Touring the Sacred Places. Uh, Malini, would you like to read? Okay. Lord Balaram prepared himself to meet the demon Balvala. At the time when the demon usually attacks the sacred place, there appeared a great hell storm. The whole sky became covered with dust and the atmosphere became surcharged with a filthy smell. Just after this, the mischievous demon, Balvala, began to shower torrent of stool and urine and other impure substances on the arena of sacrifice. After this onslaught, the demon himself appeared with a great trident in his hand. He was a gigantic person and his black body was like a huge mass of carbon. His hair, his beard and his mustache appeared reddish like copper. And because of his great beard and mustache, his mouth appeared to be very dangerous and fierce. As soon as he saw the demon, Lord Balaram prepared to attack him. He first began to consider how he could smash the great demon to pieces. Lord Balaram called for his plow and club, and they immediately appeared before him. The demon Balvala was flying in the sky, and at the first opportunity, Lord Balaram dragged him down with his plow and angrily smashed the demon's head with his club. But Balaram striking the forehead of the demon became fractured. There was a profuse, a profuse, sorry, sorry. There was a profuse flow of blood from the, his forehead, and he began to scream loudly. In this way, the demon, who had been such a great disturbance to the to the pious Brahmins, fell to the ground. His falling was like a great mountain with a red oxy peak, being struck by a thunderbolt and smashed to the ground. The, in <clears throat> the inhabitants of Naimisharanya, learned sages and brahmanas, began became most pleased by seeing this, and they offered their respectful prayers to Lord Balaram. They offered their heartfelt blessings upon the Lord, and all agreed that Lord Balaram's attempt to do anything would never be a failure. The sages and brahmanas then performed a ceremonial bathing of Lord Balaram, just as King Indra is bathed by the demigods when he is victorious over the demons. The brahmanas and sages honored Lord Balaram by presenting him 
first class new clothing and ornaments and the lotus flower garland of victory, the reservoir of all beauty, which was never to be dried up, being in everlasting existence. After this incident, Lord Balaram took permission from the Brahmanas assembled at Naimisharanya and accompanied by other Brahmanas, went to the bank of the river Kaushiki. Kosh, Kosh, After taking his bath in this holy place, he proceeded towards the river Sarayu and visited the source of the river. He began to travel on the bank of the Sarayu River and he gradually reached Prayag, where there is a confluence of three rivers, the Ganges, Yamuna, and Sarasvati. Here also he regularly took his bath, worshiped the local temples of God, and as it is enjoined in the Vedic literature, offered oblations to the forefathers and sages. <clears throat> he gradually reached the ashram of the sage Kulaha, and from there he went to the Gandaki, Gandaki, on the river Gomati. After this, he took his bath in the river Vipassa. Then gradually he came to the bank of the Sona River. The Sona River is still running as one of the big rivers on, in the Behar, Behar province. He also took his bath there and performed the Vedic ritualistic ceremonies. He continued his travels and gradually came to the pilgrimage city of Gaya, where there is a celebrated Vishnu temple. According to the advice of his father Vasudev, he offered oblations to the forefathers in this Vishnu temple. From here, he traveled to the delta of the Ganges, where the sacred river Ganges mixes with the Bay of Bengal. This sacred place is called Ganga Sagar. And at the end of January each year, there is a great assembly of saintly persons and pious men, just as there is an assembly of saintly persons in Prayag every year, which is called, which is called the Mag Mela Fair. Mm -hmm. that bathing, you know, the bathing and the, the new, new clothing and ornaments, it's like the, Deity worship, like deity worship, just happening in real. He's doing pilgrimage, time. and yeah, his his father Vasudev recommended he he visited the Vishnu temple in Gaya. I find it interesting because, like, we hear a lot about the Kumbh Mela, Prayag, Mag Mela, Kumbh Mela. So here's another spot uh, that there's a there's some sort of Mela of of saintly persons, Ganga Sagara. Hare Krishna. Um, Lakshmi Priya or Rachel, would you like to read? Thank you. After finishing his bathing and ritualistic ceremonies on the Ganga Sagara, Lord Balaram proceeded toward the mountains known as Mahindra Parva Parvata. At this place, he met Parasurama, the incarnation of Lord Krishna, and he offered him respects by bowing down before him. After this, he gradually turned towards southern India and visited the banks of the river Godavari. After taking his bath in the river Godavari and performing the necessary ritualistic ceremonies, he gradually visited the other rivers, the Vena, Pampa, Bhima, Rati, on the hand of the river Bhimarati, he there is a deity called Swami Kartikeya. After visiting Kartikeya, Lord Balaram gradually proceeded to Silapura, a pilgrimage city in the province of Maharashtra. Silapura is one of the biggest districts in Maharashtra province. He then gradually proceeded toward the Dravidadesha, southern India, is divided into five parts called Pancha, Pancha, Dravi, Pancha Dravida, northern Pancha, India. Pancha Dravida. Pancha Dravida. 
Northern India is also divided into five parts called Pancha, Panchagora. All the important acharyas of the modern age, namely Sanka, Sankaracharya, or Marmanujacharya, Madhavacharya, Vishnu Swami, Swami and Nimbarka, and advented themselves in these Dravida, Dravida provinces. Lord Chaitanya appeared in Bengal, which is part of the five Gora Deshas, the most important place of pilgrimage in southern India, or Dravida is Venkatachala, Venkatachala, commonly known as Balaji. After visiting this place, Lord Balaram proceeded toward Vishnu Kanchi, and from there he proceeded on the bank of the Kaveri. He took his bath in the river Kaveri. Then he gradually reached Ranga, Ranga Kshetra, the biggest temple in the world is, is in Ranga, Ranga Chetra. And the Vishnu deity there is celebrated as Ranga, Ranga, Ranganatha, Ranganatha. A similar temple of uh, Ranganatha is in Vrindavan, although it is not as big as the temple in Ranga Chetra. While going to Vishnu Khan. Kanchi, while going to Vishnu country, Lord Balarama also, also visited Shiva, Shiva Kanchi after visiting Raga Shetra. He gradually proceeded toward Maha Mathura, commonly visiting Raga, Raga, Raga Shetra. He gradually proceeded, oh, sorry, commonly known as the Mathura. Tura of southern India. After visiting this place, he gradually proceeded toward Setubanda. Setubanda is a place where Lord Ramachandra constructed the stone bridge from India to Lanka. Lord Ramachandra constructed the stone bridge. For, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, in this particularly holy place, Lord Balarama distributed. 10,000 cows to the local Romana priests. It is in the Vedic custom that when a rich visitor goes to any place of pilgrimage, pilgrimage, he gives in charity to the local priests, gives in charity to the local priests gifts of horses, cows, ornaments, and garments. This system of visiting places of pilgrimage and providing the local Brahmana priests with all necessary necessities of life has greatly deteriorated in the age of Kali. The richer section of the population, because of its degradation in Vedic culture, is no longer attracted by these places of pilgrimage. And the culture and the Brahmana priests who depended on such visitors have also deteriorated and their professional duty of helping the visitors. These Brahmana priests and their and the places of pilgrimage are called Panda and Pandit. The, this means that they formerly were very learned Brahmanas and used and used to guide the visitors in all details of the purpose of coming there. And thus both the visitors and the priests were benefited by mutual cooperation. It is clear from the description of the Srimad Bhagavatam that when Lord Balaram, Balarama was visiting the different places of pilgrimage, he probably followed the Vedic system. After dis distributing cows at Setubandha, Lord Balarama proceeded toward the Kritamala and Tam, Tamraparani river, rivers. These two rivers are celebrated as sacred and Lord Balarama bathed in both. He then proceeded toward Malaya, Malaya Hill. This Malaya Hill is very great and it is said that it is one of the seven peaks called the Malaya Hills. Hills. The great sage Agastya used to live there 
the, the Lord Balarama visited him and offered his respects by bowing down before him. After taking the sage's blessings, Lord Balarama, with the sage's per permission, proceeded toward the Indian Ocean. We can see, I'm thinking like in the modern day, there's the principle of tenure. A university professor at some point gets tenure. Of course, it's misused in so many ways. But that's the principle that the, the, the Brahmins of society, they give knowledge. They give knowledge and, and they give knowledge about everything, spiritual life, and they give guidance and knowledge. And, uh, and they're, not, they're not taking a salary. They're, they're, not they're not dependent on any one salary. They're not dependent on the military industrial complex, right? They're not dependent, well, oh, if I actually share honestly, then I might be kicked out, like whatever. I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna be truthful, Brahminical principles give knowledge. And then society, society, they naturally support the Brahmins. Actually, in an advanced stage, members of society realize, actually even this farm I have, the, this house, actually everything belongs to the Brahmins. So let's give it to them for their use. And the Brahmins, they have no greed. They have the true Brahmins, they have no greed. So whatever they get, they, they use it for the true, watering the root of the tree, the true, the, 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 the true benefit in the highest sense of, of society. And so that's actually what the, the modern tenure system is supposed to be, that the true, the true intellectuals of society who are supposed to be spiritually wise, it's kind of become the opposite, but that they're not, they're not dependent for their basic needs on, they need to say certain things to make sure that this group is pleased so they get their salary. And that's the idea of tenure. Of course, now it's become, oh, now I have tenure. I can be lazy and I can just say, I mean, it's become misused in different ways. But this is, it. So, so the Brahmins have no material greed and they're naturally supported and they are free. They're free to be honest and share knowledge. <clears throat> it seems like it's the opposite. I think it's a, obvious to uh, come to a best of platform of wanting to express truth. Yeah. They lose their job. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, it become the opposite. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. True. You need to, you need to uh, kowtow and you need to join the herd of independent minds. Right. All of the independent thinkers say this. You, you say this too, right? Like that. Oh, of course. <laughs> okay. Um, at the point of the Cape, there is a big temple of the goddess Durga, where she is known as Kanya Kumari. This temple of Kanya Kumari was also visited by Lord Ramachandra, and therefore, it is to be understood that the temple has been existing for millions of years. From there, Lord Balaram went on to visit the pilgrimage city known as Falguna Tirtha, which is on the shore of the Indian Ocean or the Southern Ocean. Falguna Tirtha is celebrated because Lord Vishnu in his incarnation of Ananta is lying there. From Falguna Tirtha, Lord Balaram went on to visit another pilgrimage spot known as Pancha Psarasa. There, also, he bathed according to the regular principles and observed the ritualistic ceremonies. This site is also celebrated as a shrine of Lord Vishnu. Therefore, Lord Balaram distributed 10,000 cows to the local Brahmin priests. From Cape Comorin, Lord Balaram turned toward Kerala. The country of Kerala is still existing in southern India under the name of South Kerala. After visiting this place, he came to Gokarna Tirtha, where Lord Shiva is constantly worshipped. Balaram then visited the temple of Arya Devi, which is completely surrounded by water. From that island, he went on to a place known as Shurparaka. After this, he bathed in the rivers known as Tapi, Payoshni, and Nirvindya. And he came to the forest known as Dandakaranya. <clears throat> This is the same Dandakaranya forest where Lord Ramachandra lived while he was in exile. Lord Balaram next came to the bank of the river Narmada, the biggest river in central India. 
On the bank of the sacred Narmada, there is a pilgrimage spot known as Mahishmati Puri. After bathing there, according to regulative principles, Lord Balaram returned to Prabhasa Tirtha, wherefrom he had begun his journey. When Lord Balaram returned to Prabhasa Tirtha, he heard from the Brahmins that most of the Kshatriyas in the Battle of Kurukshetra had been killed. Balaram felt relieved to hear that the burden of the world had been reduced. Lord Krishna and Balaram appeared on this earth to lessen the burden of military strength created by the ambitious Kshatriya kings. This is the way materialistic life, not being satisfied by the absolute necessities of life. People ambitiously create extra demands and their illegal desires are checked by the laws of nature or by the laws of God, appearing as famine, war, pestilence, and similar catastrophes. Lord Balaram heard that although most of the Kshatriyas had been killed, the Kurus were still engaged in fighting. Therefore, he returned to the battlefield just on the day Bhima Sena and Duryodhan were engaged in a personal duel. As well-wisher both of them, Lord Balaram wanted to stop them, but they would not stop. When Lord Balaram appeared on the scene, King Yudhisthira and his young brothers, Nikola Sahadev, Lord Krishna and Arjuna, immediately offered him their respectful obeisances, but they did not speak at all. The reason they were silent was that Lord Balaram was somewhat affectionate toward Duryodhan, and Duryodhan had learned from Balaramji the art of fighting with a club. Thus, when the fighting was going on, King Yudhisthira and others thought that Balaram might come there to say something in favor of Duryodhan, and they therefore remained silent. Both Duryodhan and Bhima Sena were very enthusiastic in fighting with clubs. <clears throat> and in the midst of large audiences, each was very skillfully trying to strike the other. And while attempting to do so, they appeared to be dancing. <clears throat> but although they appeared to be dancing, it was clear that both of them were very angry. Malini, would you like to complete the chapter? Okay. Lord Balaram, wanting to stop the fighting, said, My dear King Duryodhan and Bhima Sen, I know that both of you are great fighters and are well known in the world as great heroes. But still, I think that Bhima Sen is superior to Duryodhan in bodily strength. On the other hand, Duryodhan is superior in the art of fighting with a club. Taking this into consideration, my opinion is that neither of you is inferior to the other in fighting. Under the circumstances, there is very little chance of one of you being defeated by the other. Therefore, I request you not to waste your time in fighting in this way. I wish you to stop this unnecessary fight. The good instruction given by Lord Balaram to both Bhima Sen and Duryodhan was intended for the equal benefit of both of them. But they were so unwrapped in anger against each other that they could only remember their long-lasting personal, personal enmity. Each thought only of killing the other, and they did not give much importance to the instruction of Lord Balaham. Both of them then became like madmen in remembering the strong accusations and ill behavior they had exchanged with one another. Lord Balaham being able to understand the destiny which was awaiting them was not eager to go further in the matter. Therefore, instead of staying, he decided to return to the city of Dwarka. When he returned to Dwarka, he was received with great jubilation by relatives and friends, aided by King Ugrasena and other elderly person. All of them came from the, the welcome came, came forward to welcome Lord Balaham. After this, he again went to the holy place of pilgrimage at Naimesharanya, and the sages, saintly person, and Brahmins all received him standing. They understood that Lord Balaram, also a Kshatriya, was now retired from the fighting business. The Brahmins and the sages, who were always for peace and tranquility, were very pleased at this. All of them embraced Balaram with great affection and understood to perform various kinds of sacrifices in that sacred spot of Naimesharanya, 
actually Lord Barra um, had no business performing the sacrifices recommended by ordinary human beings. He is the supreme personality of Godhead, and therefore he himself is enjoyer of such sacrifices. As such, his exemplary action in performing sacrifices was only to give a lesson to the common man, to show how one should abide, abide, I abide, I abide. <laughs> By the injunction of the Vedas. The Supreme Personality of God at Balaram is treating the sages and subtly persons and now Mishraanya on the subject matter of the living entities, relationship with this cosmic manifestation, and on how one should accept this whole universe and how one should relate to this cosmic in order to achieve the highest goal of perfection. The understanding of that the whole cosmic manifestation is resting on the Supreme Personality of Godhead and that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is also an all-pervading, even within the minutest atom, by the function of his Paramatma feature. Lord Balaram then took the Ava Brita bus, which is accepted after finishing sacrificial performances. After taking his bath, he dressed himself in new sickle garments and decorated himself with beautiful jewelry amidst his relatives and friends. He appeared to be shining full moon amidst the luminaries in the sky. Lord Baharam is the personality of God and Ananta himself. Therefore, he is beyond the scope of understanding my mind, intelligence, or body. He descends exactly like a human being and behaves in that way for his own purpose. We can only explain his activity as the Lord's pastimes. No one can even estimate the extent of the unlimited demonstration of his pastime because he is all powerful. Lord Baram is the original Vishnu. Therefore, anyone remembering this pastime of Lord Balaram in the morning and evening, will certainly become a great devotee of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and thus his life will become successful in all respects. Thus, on the Bhaktivedanta purpose of the 78th chapter of Krishna, the liberation of Balvala and Lord Balaram storing sacred places. Lord Balaram Ki Jai. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Before we close, any comments, realizations, or questions? I appreciate your point about dressing the Lord, that he dressed in new clothes and mm. garments yeah. and jewelry. And so we, the we Brahmanas must... were doing that, right? The Brahmanas were. Yeah, but he, was, he, was, he also does it to himself. Mm. So. Yeah. It's nice to hear, to hear about, okay, what, what does Lord Balaram like? What does Lord Krishna like? And even expand it to, you know, Srila Prabhupada and, and, you know, the pure devotees to know what they like. And I was thinking this morning about Vyasa Puja coming soon, and I was thinking, okay, let's make sure that whatever feast we cook as a community, that it's really connected with what does Prabhupada mm -hmm. likes. Like, yes. okay, what, what does he like? And then whatever we cook, we do it for his pleasure. What does Balaram like? Silk garments, apparently, because that's what he wants to yeah. put on himself. And jewelries, and what else? What else does he put on himself? Anyway, perfume and oil and all those things. So to really, but as we read the Shastra to uh, more and more know, okay, mm. what the Lord like? What does he love? What does he want? How can we serve him according to his desire rather than serving him according to our own desire? Jai. 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 Appearance day of Lord Balaram Ki. Jai. 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 Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thanks for your association and presence. Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm.